Let us pray. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be always acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength, our Redeemer. Amen. <clears throat> what a privilege for me and, and pleasure to be with you. I bring you the greetings of Emmanuel Church in uh, Emmanuel Episcopal. There are other Emmanuels. I keep forgetting. There's an Emmanuel Mennonite Church. That's right. See, we're all somewhat tribal, aren't we? But um, today's message is about God's big, big tribe. We heard the scripture of the first of, of the call of Abraham and Sarah. They're renaming, they're repurposing. And uh, this is the second time we, we have this call to them. The first one is in chapter 12 when God said, I want you to go and I'm going to show you where you're going to be, but no maps, no GPS, no ways, no Google. You're just going to go. And they do. So today, in this reading, now God comes to Abraham and specifically says that they are going to have a covenant. I will make my covenant between me and you. Now, covenants word that is not used much outside of church, churchy circles, often mistaken as a contract or an agreement. And you know, on a contract, you have to, your responsibilities, and if you follow the words of the contract, then some good stuff happens, and if not, some bad stuff happens. That's how it goes. And... Um, and I think that often in the church we too forget what God means by covenant because we treat it as rules. This is what you will do if you want God's favor. But covenants are always, in all instances in the scripture, something that God gives. It starts with God. God reaches out to Abraham and Sarah, appears to to them when they're well into the years and says, I am God Almighty. This is who I am. And an invitation then to what the true meaning of covenant is, a relationship. Walk with me. Walk with me. Walk before me and be blameless. Enter into this relationship. The God of the scriptures is always a God in the move and calling us to move. In this relationship, then, God says, I give you my favor for you, for your descendants, as we heard in the marvelous sermon. I almost feel like my speaking is somewhat superfluous. We already had two great sermons, the choir and the children's. But we have here this invitation to be in relationship with, with God. It is not about rules, though that's so often what we devolve it into. It is about being in a relationship that is life-giving, that gives purpose and meaning to our lives, that sets us on a course of being collaborators with God's dream, of being shapers of the dream that God has. I know you're not creedal type, you know, in your tradition, and, and very intentional or so, and that is an appropriate thing that those of us who like creeds need to hear. Uh, but in the scriptures here so often, what we have is, is creedal language in terms of what's said here about covenant. Uh, one of my favorite writers in the, of the, about the Hebrew Scriptures, Walter Brueggemann talks about how the covenant relationship is always expressed in words that come out to be creedal terms. They're expressions of the relationship that, that have evolved, and they get repeated, and they get handed down, which is really how you end up with a creed, and then it becomes the basis on which we ground our relationship. And he points out in one of his writings how the, 
particular verse on Exodus 34, 6 and 7, after the giving of the covenant at Sinai, says, has these words, these, these verses that give a descriptive, creedal statement of the relationship that, that we have with God because God came out looking for us and called us to walk before him. The Lord, the Lord, a God of tenderness and compassion, slow to anger, rich in kindness, and abounding in faithfulness. For the thousandth generation, the Lord maintains his kindness, forgiving all our faults, transgressions, and sins. That's a confession. That is a statement of the relationship that we have, and it is the reflection of the experience that we have of what God has done in reaching out to us. From the very beginning, I tend to think of the creation itself as the first covenant when God said, let there be light. And God said, it is good. And then of all things, when God finished making us human beings, God said, very good. Almost like rubbing God's hands and saying, yes, I like this. We are made to walk before God. And this calling is so that there is a great opening of expansion of the love of God, the steadfast love of God. It's that Bible, that translation that, that I use the most calls it steadfast love from the Hebrew word hesed. And so often it's translated as covenant love or faithful love. Or maybe in today's language, we would call it unconditional love. This is a God who is in relation. The God we know is not some static, fixed, unmoved mover, but a God in relation. One who calls creation into being, who then, when everything seems lost, you know, you go through the first 11 chapters of Genesis and everything seems lost by the time that we all get scattered into our own little tribes and multiple nations with so many different languages that can't even understand each other. And now God says, when all that happens, no, 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 we're not done here. And calls Abraham and Sarah, go. And this covenant is the continuation of that. Here we have an unsettling God, as Walter Brueggemann calls him, who is about calling us in a in relationship, and a relationship that, yes, we could look at it as just the rules, if we wish, but it's not about that. It's about recognizing that we are alive to God, and God is alive in us, and that God is calling us to this great repurposing. The renaming of Abraham and Sarah, when they go from Abram to Abraham and Sarai to Sarah, is about recognizing you have a mission. I am choosing you. I am choosing you because I want to find everybody. Because I want, a reach, I want to reach everyone. And so you will be a blessing to all the nations. God loves everybody. No exceptions. We make the exceptions. God doesn't. And when we are called to walk humbly with God, to be in that relationship, we are invited to be transformed from people who see only a certain amount of folks as our kin to recognizing our kinship not only with all human beings but with the entire created order. That we all come from God and all return to God. And so today when we are looking at this covenant, we ask ourselves, and what is our purpose? What are we called to do? Well, you are called, we are called to be communities of love. Communities that show one another, live with one another in such love 
that others begin to notice. They shall know they are Christians by their love. See how they love one another. If people can say that, we begin to alter and put upside down on its head the order that seems to be ruling the day. We can be people who, as Paul says, hope against hope, as Abraham and Sarah did, no matter what seems to be the evidence of a world that keeps falling apart. We can be bearers of a message that says, no, no, the tribe is so much bigger. The tribe includes everyone. Nobody is beyond the reach of God's loving, saving embrace. And we are here to show it, to live it, to extend it, to share it. We are called into this relationship not so that we can hoard it, but so that we can share it. And where are we in our lives? Are we living as best we can and with God's help to be people who love one another? Are we living in such a way that it might make a difference to someone around us and open the door to see a new reality that already exists in God? Are we open to extending God's love? William Temple, who was Archbishop of Canterbury during the Second World War, once wrote that the church is the only association that exists for the sake of those who are not its members. We are called to walk humbly with God, not as a precondition, but as a consequence of what God has already done for us. And so we are invited to be repurposed, to live into that name that we have received as child of God in Christ. As children of God in Christ, to live in such a way that we become agents of God's transforming, redeeming, restoring love so that we are in relationship with God and all are in relationship with God and with one another. I close with this prayer also written by William Temple. Almighty and eternal God, so draw our hearts to thee so guide our minds, so fill our imaginations, so control our wills, that we may be wholly thine, utterly dedicated unto thee, and then use us, we pray thee, as thou wilt, and always to thy glory and the welfare of thy people, through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.